you to uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34 is our text together. It might help if I put my microphone on. First Corinthians, kind of bouncing around a little bit, if you've been following us, uh, we were, we began chapter 12 a couple of weeks ago, and I got to verse 11, and I told you that on the Lord's day, the, the first Sunday of the month, we come back to this passage in First Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 34, because it's what we're doing today. We are partaking of the Lord's Supper, and so I wanted to teach this passage of Scripture in light of what we're going to be doing, and so that we would have an understanding of what we do when we gather around the Lord's Supper, and uh, no better place to go than the actual Scriptures to see what the Scriptures teach about this, and that's what we're going to do. I want to read it, and then I'm going to have a word of prayer, and I want to re- um, not only pray for the Lord's blessing upon um, what we're doing right now, but I also want to lift up. John and Margarita, uh, to, to the Lord. Um, they are going through some trouble right now as uh, John has lost his sister. She died today. And uh, Margarita's sister is, is actually um, going to be dying any moment. The both of us, they're both of their sisters are dying, and it's really uh, a tough thing to go through. So um, after I read this passage, I want to include them in my prayer, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention as well. So you find that place in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Follow along in your copy of the Bible, verses 17 through 34. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or... Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man, let a woman examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, 
Let them eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Father, I want to come to you in the name of the precious name of the Lord Jesus and give you thanks and praise for this time of gathering. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified, and that you would help me proclaim the truth of thy word. You'll give ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand. And you would be with those who cannot be with us this morning as we are uh, one body in Christ. And I pray for John and Margarita as they grieve the loss of John's sister and they are, as they are preparing to grieve the loss of Margarita's sister, Regina. And we lift them up to you and all the families that are involved and we pray for healing. We pray for a comforting of the Holy Spirit and, and the touch of the Father's hand. And as John told me that he read Psalm 23 uh, to his sister and held her hand as she passed from this life to the next. Uh, may that be a, a reminder to not only John and Margarita, but to all of us that this life uh, is not guaranteed forever, that we all must be prepared to meet our maker. And I pray that everyone here today, as well as everybody in John and Margarita's family, is prepared to meet uh, you, our maker, and help us today as we hear your word. May you use it to prepare us spiritually, uh, to, to worship you today from our hearts, but also to know for sure that if we would have passed from this life to the next, that we would know for sure that our sins are forgiven. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. And so as I read that passage of Scripture to you, it's a... Uh, fitting for what we're about to do in a little while. And, you know, when you go to either a wedding or a funeral, uh, the person who is officiating either the wedding or the funeral, they usually state the purpose of the gathering together. We are, you would hear them say something like, we are gathered here for, right? Uh, um, just recently we had a wedding and we, we were gathered to uh, witness the wedding vows of such and such a person and to also worship the creator who has instituted this wonderful thing called marriage. And, and then in a, in a funeral, we are gathered together uh, to honor that life that was lived and also to worship God. But could, could you imagine if you went to a wedding or to a funeral and you're sitting there and you know the, the purpose of that gathering and then all of a sudden uh, it's perverted. Uh, it becomes maybe a, a party or some kind of bizarre event that just should not be. It's not fitting for the wedding, right? Uh, the, the attention is no longer on the bride or it's on something else. It's, it's not on the Lord. It's on something else. And, and then the gathering in a, in a funeral, uh, the, the, some kind of mockery is made of that gathering, of the, just the brokenness of people's hearts. It would just be just appalling to you, would it not? And that is what is happening here in the church of Corinth. They have perverted the Lord's Supper. There is a purpose uh, for the gathering together around the Lord's Supper. They are two solemn and sacred activities that the Lord has given to the church. They are called ordinances. And they there's two of them. There are, one is called baptism and the other is called the Lord's Supper. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper are called ordinances because they were given by Jesus to the church and he's commanded us to partake in these different events. It's what makes a church a church. Uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism is only to be done by the church, at the church, and it's for the church, for glorifying the Lord. Uh, there's other gatherings that are out there. There, there are uh, college students that get together for a time of fellowship and things of that nature. There's all kinds of different gatherings out there. But what makes the church unique and what makes the church the church is that they obey these two uh, ordinances that were given to them by the Lord, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I don't know if you know this, but in baptism we are told by Jesus that, that we're to obey that great commission to go out into all the world and make disciples. We're to evangelize people. Every believer 
is commanded to evangelize, to share the gospel with lost people around them. And when you make a disciple or when a disciple is made by trusting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their, their first step of obedience is baptism. They are to walk into the waters like Jesus went into the water and he was baptized. A new believer is, ought, is, ought, ought to be baptized as well. And that begins their, their I guess you can call it their purifi purification uh, process. They, they're, they're purified right there. Uh, they've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're forgiven of all their sins. And that water symbolizes their purification. They are, they've been washed from all their sins. Uh, the water does not wash away their sins, but it symbolizes that. It's the beginning of what has happened in their heart. They've been purified. They're to be baptized in the name of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's a sacred and solemn time in a believer's life, and it begins their Christian life. It's only to happen once in, in your life as a Christian. But the Lord's Supper is different. We're to come together and we are to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. We're to celebrate that he died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And, that, and we're to also look forward to him coming back someday. And we're to do that. And, and when we partake of the Lord's Supper, before we partake of it, as we're going to see in the passage that we're looking at today, we're to pause we're to look within our hearts to see and, and know for sure that we are right with God to the best of our knowledge, that, and that we're also right with people around us, and that we are truly looking to Christ, who is the person that we're supposed to be celebrating what he did for us. And every time we do that, we are also purifying ourselves. We are being purified. The body of Christ is being purified as you begin your walk with the Lord through baptism. And every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, you don't just do it. You should never just do it. You should pause. And we're going to learn that today. And we're to examine ourselves before the Lord. And so the Lord has given these two ordinances for us to purify us, to make us the pure, blameless bride of Christ. And it's a part of the life of the church that is supposed to be an active part of the church to make us become the people that God wants us to become. And so we are going to do that today. And as we continue our study here in 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians had a problem with worship. That's what these verses of Scripture, from even from chapter 12 all the way, to the end of chapter 14, the Corinthians had an issue about worship. Uh, in this case, they took a solemn and a sacred time of communion with the Lord around the table, and they made it the exact opposite of what it was supposed to portray. And so Paul, in calling the Corinthians to sanctify their observation of the Lord's Supper, Paul is going to give us three things to think about this morning. He's going to show us the perversion of the Lord's Supper in verses 17 to 22. And then he's going to show us in verses 23 to 26 the Lord's purpose for the Lord's Supper. And then finally, in verses 27 to 34, the right preparation for the Lord's Supper. So the perversion, the purpose, and the right preparation for for the Lord's Supper. So if you have your copy of the Bible there, look at verse 17. He says, Now when given these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. You notice those words, come together. You'll see them again in verse 18. First of all, when you come together, you'll see it again in verse 20. Uh, therefore, when you come together, and then go all the way down to verse 34, uh, um, lest you come together for judgment. That is the main purpose of what Paul is talking about here. Over and over again, he's giving them that you are coming together for the wrong reason. You're perverting the Lord's Supper. So therefore, it's telling us that there is a purpose and a meaning for why believers 
come together. They come together for a reason. You and I, as the church of, of Christ, are a called out assembly. We are a gathering of the people of God. We gather, we come together as a church for a reason and for a purpose. And he says to the Corinthians that you are coming together, not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, the purpose of your gathering together, you should not even be getting together. You're getting together for the worse, not for the better. Their time of gathering did more harm than it did good. It would have been better if they didn't gather at all. If you turn over to chapter 14 in your Bibles, verse 26, it, it, it actually tells us why we should be getting together. It says here in verse 26, How is it then, brethren, that whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation? Look what it says here. Let all things be done for what? For edification. The gathering together of the church, that we, when we gather together, the fundamental purpose of why we gather together is for edification. And that word edification means to be built up. And so if, I don't know why you come to church. I don't know what gets you out of bed on Sunday morning. Maybe mom and dad makes you come. Maybe you come because you feel guilty or something like that. I don't know why you come. But the scripture says that you ought to come for edification. You ought, to be coming, you ought to be coming to church to be built up. Why should, be, why should you want that? For all week long, you've been torn down. All week long, the world has been bartering you with all kinds of philosophy and all kinds of thoughts, and you've been listening to things that, that are, don't glorify the Lord. You've been seeing things that are, that are not you know, thing, things you should be looking at. Sometimes you can help it. Sometimes you can't, right? But all the worldly stuff and all the things around us, you're, 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 it's, being, it's all hitting you, right? To come together as a church, as a group of believers, we ought to come together uh, to be edified, to be built up. And the only thing, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I should be able to just stand here and read you the Bible. That's all I should have to do because it's God's word his word and his word alone that will build you up. God's word builds us up. It produces in us the faith. It come, the Bible says without the hearing of the word, right, we will not have any faith. We have faith through the hearing of God's word. God's word builds us up, and that's what we need to do. We come together for that purpose of being built up. And so the Corinthians were coming together, and it says you've, you're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. And that word worse implies that they, was com they were coming together for a moral evil. There was evil taking place in the Corinthian church. Verse 18 says, But first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe you. I believe that it's actually happening. There were divisions in the church. Now, these were not divisions like uh, what was happening back in the beginning of the study that we had that the Corinthian church was saying, some were saying, I'm of Paul, some were saying, I'm of Apollos, some were saying, I'm of Peter, some were saying, I'm of Christ. And, and there was these divisions of who they were following in the church. And some were following this leader, some were following that leader. That's not what he's talking about here. They were gathering together, not for the better, but for the worse. And their gatherings were marked by evil. They were exploiting the poor that was among them. They were doing things that were totally, totally against the whole picture of what the body of Christ is meant to portray. Our coming together is meant to come together as one. The Lord's Supper was meant to bring together so that they would share, share a meal together, but they couldn't even do that. There were divisions. In verse 19, he says, for there must also be factions. That's another word for divisions among you. Why? That those who are approved may be recognized among you. This is an interesting point he's bringing out here. Uh, no church wants to go through a, a, a division. No, no church wants to go through a split, right? When churches go through splits, it's, it's ugly. It's, it's not a good thing. But in this case, he's saying there must also be 
factions among you, these divisions. Why? That those who are approved may be recognized among you. You know, there's a parable in Matthew chapter 13, and we don't have to turn to it, but just keep it in mind. Uh, Jesus talks about the wheat and the tares. It's a parable in reference to the end times. And the wheat are supposed to be the be true believers, and the tares are going to be unbelievers. And during the church age, the wheat and the tares, at a certain time of their growth, as they're growing, they look the same. You can't tell the difference between wheat and tare. And so uh, the people wanted to tear it all up now. Get all the tares out of there. Get it out of there now. He said, no, 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 don't do, don't do it now, because in doing that, you might pull out the wheat. They look the same. So just wait for the harvest. And as they grow, right, process reveals what are wheat and what are tares. And the same thing is happening here in the Corinthian church. He says there must be divisions among you because those who are approved are going to be made evident, are going to be shown to be real or to be phony. And so as Jesus says about, this, about the wheat and tares, you wait until the end and then, he, then all the tares are removed. And so what this is saying in 1 Corinthians to us, that even in the church of God, even in our building here or in other churches that are gathering, not everyone's a believer. And sometimes disagreements and fights and stuff happen inside a church. It reveals the true nature in the heart of an individual. And so he's saying, he's saying, in a sense, sometimes factions among you must happen because they're going to reveal the true nature of a person. And if you're an unbeliever, you're going to have a different mindset that a Christian has because Christians ought to be here for the purpose of worshiping the Lord. And it's not about me, it's about the Lord, right? But sometimes unbelievers don't have that mindset. And so that disagreement reveals the true nature of that person. Now, this doesn't always mean that for the saved and the unsaved within a church, but it also can ap apply to the mature and the immature within a church. There's some mature believers who who say, hey, you know, I don't care what color the carpet is. I don't care, I don't care if the air conditioner is on a certain temperature. Or I don't care if the music's loud. I don't care if, if we're singing hymns or we're singing contemporary music. I just don't care. Just, I'm just here to serve the Lord. And then you have other ones who are a little bit, a little, who are not, don't have that mindset, and they're complaining about every stinking thing that is going on in the church. And divisions take place. And he says that these divisions are not always good, but in this case it is good because it's going to show and reveal those who are approved and those who are not approved. So people's true colors come out when these things happen. And then in verses 20 through 22, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, look what he says here, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. I, I don't know what you're doing, Corinthians, but you're not coming together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so that tells me, listen, we can partake of the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of every month. We can just go through it and just do it, right? But if we're not doing it for the purpose of why Christ has given it to the church, we're just doing it. And we're just gathered together. But it's not. It's not, he says, to eat the Lord's Supper and then he goes on to explain exactly what this moral evil was in the church. He says in verse 21, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. Wow. So what was happening here was they were rich, and they were poor people in the church. The poor people took a little longer to get to church. You know, they may have lived further away. Maybe they didn't have uh, the uh, accessibility to get to the church quick as the other people could. The rich people got there quicker, and they wouldn't wait for the poor people. Not only that, they would make these elaborate meals, and they would just eat and not wait for the poor people, and just have a great feast. And not only that, where they were, began to drink, and drinking led to them getting drunk. Christians in church getting drunk. Can you imagine that? Wow. Not a Baptist church, right? No way. I mean, the cup that we drink today, even today, only has juice in it, just so you know, okay? But that just is bizarre. It's appalling to us. And they were perverting the Lord's Supper. What was meant to gather people together, rich, poor, young, old, 
right? No matter what your social status, and Jew and Gentile, right? Gathered together under, under the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us worshiping the Lord. This was not happening in the Corinthian church. They were perverting the Lord's Supper, gathering together. He says, what in the world are you doing? Verse 22, do you not have houses to eat and drink or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I don't, I don't praise you in this. What was supposed to be a meaningful time of worship, you have perverted and it's become a selfish time of personal indulgence. It does not portray what the Lord's Supper is supposed to portray. And so what is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? In verses 23 to 26, he says, uh, For I receive from the Lord. So what you're doing is not what I receive from the Lord. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Catch this. He's saying, I, all, I, I delivered it to you. I already told you. I've already taught you how you should be partaking of the Lord's Supper, and you are perverting the actual words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to look at that next phrase there. I delivered to you, and then he says that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. There's a historical setting taking place here. On the same night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, and then a few hours later, he was going to be nailed to a cross, and he was going to die an unbelievable death in the same night. There's a wonderful glimpse of light. There's a wonderful glimpse of love being taken place in, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of human depravity, in the midst of people just hating Jesus and wanting him to die, and in even, even in the midst of the Corinthians who, who are perverting the Lord's Supper. In the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus is going to bring light and love to the world. He's going to go to the cross and die for our sins. What a wonderful, wonderful picture of Jesus' selfless, devoted life to die for our sins. He says, in that same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and catch this in verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. What is Jesus thanking God for? Ever wonder about that? Is he just thanking, you know, like you know how we, we pause before we eat a meal and we bow our heads and we thank God for the food? I mean, that's what you should do that. It's a good thing to do. What is Jesus thanking God for? Is he just thanking him for the bread and the meal? Hmm, I think it's more to it than that, don't you? That Jesus knows what, where he's going. Jesus knows what's going to happen to him. And he's thanking God Almighty. Other times in, 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 in the Gospels, Jesus thanked God, his Father, that, he, that he, he, he concealed truth from certain prideful religious people and he revealed that truth to humble followers and they were able to hear the words of Jesus and the words of God. Here he's thanking God that, that, that I'm, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to bear the sins of the world. I'm going to die for sinners. He's thanking God that he's going to die for sinners. Wow. You know what it says in the Bible that we should thank God for everything? Could you imagine that? I mean, do you act, do we, I don't do that. I don't thank God for tragedy and trials in my life. I just can't do it. Here's Jesus thanking his Father in heaven. He knows what that bread stands for. He's getting ready to go to the cross. So he says he broke it. He says to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to look at something in verse 24. He says, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. That's a bad translation. Jesus' body was not broken. No bones in the body of Jesus was broken. You understand that, right? No bones. As a matter of fact, it's prophetically that his bone, no bones would be broken, but it's also, we know, a historical fact that, that the, the soldiers went to, the, to each criminal and broke their legs when he came to Jesus. What did he do? He took a spear and he what? Pierced his side because he was already dead. He didn't, no bones on Jesus were broken. So it's actually a bad, it should say this. It should say, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. 
Jesus gave his body for you. As a matter of fact, Jesus even took on flesh for you and for me. He died for you and for me. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. In the verse 25, in the same manner, just like he did it in verse 24, he had given thanks for, for the bread. He says, in the same manner, he's given thanks for the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, before I move on to the next section, I want to bring to your attention what is the Lord's Supper. That's what those verses tell us. The Lord's Supper is, number one, twice he says this, do this in what? Remembrance of me. Now, before I even talk about that, I want to bring up another controversial thing here. Not that I like bringing up controversial things, but there is a controversial thing here. Some Christians or quote-unquote Christians, Roman Catholics, okay, I'll just say it, say it, would look at verse 24 when it says, take, eat. When Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. They actually believe that that, that actual bread and that actual cup, the drink that's in there, actually becomes, when the priest prays and gives thank, thanks, it actually becomes the literal body of Christ and the drink that is in that cup actually becomes the literal blood of Jesus. So that when that person partakes of it, they are actually eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Jesus. And so in that sense, they are receiving Christ. Now that's called the doctrine of transubstantiation. Don't make me say it again. I might stumble on it. <laughs> but it, it actually, that's what some people believe. Now I want to prove to you that that's not what he's saying here. If you look at your Bible, Jesus is holding it. And he's saying, take it, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Where is Jesus? He's in his body. He's in his body, and he's saying, this piece of bread is my body. So, of course, that bread is not his literal body. He is in his body. And he's saying, take, eat, this is my body. This piece of bread represents my body, and it's going to be given for you. And John chapter 6 talks about the bread that comes down from heaven. Again, it's symbolically speaking of the life that Jesus wants to give to you and to me. And so... Jesus is saying, symbolically, I want you to partake of this supper, that the bread represents my body that is being given for you. Symbolically, I want you to partake of the cup and drink of that drink that represents the new covenant of the blood, of my blood that was shed for you. Now, next question. How often should we do this? How often should we partake of the Lord's Supper? He says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. He doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us. And so we've chosen to do it every once a month. Some churches do it four times a year. Some churches do it every time they gather together. There's no... You can't say anything against it. It's fine. But last thing I want to bring out on this, of the purpose of the Lord's Supper, is this. Look at that last phrase in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what are you doing? You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming what Jesus has done for us. We're remembering what he did for us, and we are preaching what Jesus has done for us. And he says, do this till I come. And so in our hearts, we should be looking forward to what? to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is what the Lord's Supper is. That, that is the way we're supposed to celebrate it. Not the way the Corinthians were. They were perverting it. And so these last verses and verses 27 through 34 are the right preparation for the Lord's Supper. The right preparation for the Lord's Supper. And so how do we prepare for this wonderful event. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So he's speaking directly to the Corinthians. They were perverting the Lord's Supper, and he's saying whoever does that, 
Whoever partakes of the Lord's Supper, who eats this bread, drinks this cup in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So, that leads us to understand this much so far. There is an unworthy way, and there is a worthy way. There is a proper way and an improper way to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so, that's telling us that we just can't do the Lord's Supper. We need to make sure that we're doing it in a worthy manner. We don't want to be doing it in an unworthy manner, therefore being guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean? Look at verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself. Look at the last phrase. Not discerning the Lord's body. And so... Anytime we partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, what it looks like is that we're not discerning the Lord's body. And so, when we gather together to do this, and we're not, our minds and hearts are not engaged in what we're doing. We're not discerning what Jesus has done for us. We're not discerning what that sacrifice on the cross of Calvary was meant to accomplish. We're not discerning the Lord's body. In any way, shape, or form of partaking of the Lord's Supper, he's saying if you do it not discerning the Lord's body, you are partaking in an unworthy manner. And so let me just list for you some things that I thought through about ways in which we can be guilty of partaking in an unworthy manner. Some of us could come in a ritualistic way. I mean, in other words, we're just doing it. We, we're, we know we do it once a month, and we just go through the motions. There's, we go into the motions, but there's no emotion involved, right? There's no love for the Lord. There's no discernment of his body. We're just doing it because, hey, that's what we're supposed to do. That's why it's not good if you have young children and we're partaking of the Lord's Supper just to let them do it. They're not discerning the Lord's body. It's not a wise thing to do. So we can come ritualistically with no emotion, treating it lightly rather than seriously. That's coming to it in an unworthy manner. We can also come with wrong thinking. We can come to the Lord's Supper thinking that it imparts grace or forgiveness of our sins. That for some reason if I eat this bread and drink this from this cup, it's going to give me forgiveness of my sins. That's wrong thinking. That's, that's in line with what the Catholics would teach, that partaking of the Lord's Supper imparts grace to the person participating. But the Scriptures don't teach that. It is, do this in remembrance of me, Jesus is saying. So I need to have the right understanding. I'm not doing this to receive grace and forgiveness. I am doing this because I've already been forgiven of my sins. Thirdly, we can come to the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner if we're coming to it with unforgiveness or bitterness in our hearts. Uh, the church is one loaf. It is one body. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, Paul says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, look, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. And what the Corinthians were doing was perverting that oneness. They were dividing the church, rich and poor, and looking down upon the poor people. And so you and I, when we come today to, to partake of the Lord's Supper, are we one? Is there unforgiveness in my heart toward another brother or sister? Is that unforgiveness even got to the place where I have bitterness in my heart toward somebody that I'm supposed to be loving? And so we need to do as the scriptures tell us here in verse 28, but let a man or a woman examine himself, then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We need to pause we need to confess and ask the Lord to search our hearts and confess our, our sin to the Lord and to be sure that we are coming in the right manner to the Lord's Supper. 
asking him to examine our hearts. Then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup of the Lord. And the last thing I want to mention here regarding this very important thing about our self-examination in our own life. He says, if you don't self-examine your life, verse 29, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner uh, drinks judgment to himself. Now, look at this word judgment. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. Verse 34, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. Judgment, judgment, judgment. I mean, wow, pastor, skip that, please. It's uncomfortable. Uh, wh what are we talking about here? In, in Romans chapter 8, it clearly says that there is no condemnation, no judgment for, the, for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning, you don't have to worry about being judged for your sins. That judgment fell on Jesus. Right? He hung there for six long hours and took the punishment for my sin and yours. You don't have to worry about being judged for your sins. But just hearing that doesn't mean you just come to the Lord's Supper without judging yourself. Self-examination. Because you are adding judgment to yourself. You will be judged by the Lord. Not in the sense of being condemned with the world as you read right there. In, in verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that, when, that we may not be condemned with the world. The world is going to be condemned. God doesn't want to condemn the believer, but there is a judgment. God says, judge yourself, examine yourself, examine why you're coming to the Lord's Supper, or he will have to judge you. He will have to judge me. What is that judgment? Well, it's right there in verse 32, but when we are judged, this is by the Lord, we are chastened by the Lord. Chastened. We are disciplined. He talks about what's happening in the Corinthian church. They were perverting the Lord's Supper. It got to such an, a bad place and the extreme of the perversion caused the Lord to actually cause some of these believers in the Corinthian church to be sick. They were feeling ill and, and, and not feeling well and getting sick. And, and some, it says, were not only weak and sick, but verse 30, they were falling asleep. That, that, that's not physical sleep. That's, they were dying. The Lord was taking some of them out, striking them down, taking them home to be with him in heaven. I mean, that's not a bad thing, I guess, right? We all want to go. I don't want to go that way, though. Now, you, you read those words and you say, no, I, the Lord would never do that. Well, he did in Acts chapter 5, right? There were two believers who lied to the Holy Spirit and God took them home to be with him in heaven because they were perverting the truth. And it was happening here in the Corinthian church. And so I, I'm not saying it can happen to us today, but hey, judgment takes place in the family of God. Uh, God does discipline those who belong to him. And if you don't receive discipline, Hebrews chapter 12, from the Lord... If you're not receiving discipline and correction from God, He doesn't love you. He chastens, He corrects, He disciplines those whom He loves. I want to be loved by the Lord, don't you? And so if I am not living my life the way God wants me to live and I continue to reject counsel and I don't listen to truth and, and I'm being told and confronted and shown what is wrong in my life, and I just continue to live in that sin, I better watch out. I better watch out because I could be disciplined by the Lord, especially if I'm a believer. If I'm not a believer, I'm not going to be disciplined by the Lord. I don't know the Lord. And so this is a judgment that we want to avoid. How do we avoid that? We examine ourselves. We pause. We don't just come to the Lord's Supper and just partake of it will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And that just simply means that we'll be guilty of sin because that's what happened to the Lord. He's, he, his body, he gave his body, he gave his blood for our sin. We'll be guilty of sin and the Lord will discipline us. So how do we examine ourselves? I'm just going to give you three ways of examination and preparing ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper so that we can partake in a worthy manner. Well, the first thing we need to do is look within. 
Each one begins with the word look, okay? So you won't forget it. Look within. Is, is, there, is there sin in my life? Now, we all sin, right? Shake your head with a gun faster, all right? We all sin, but when I'm saying look within and see if there's sin in my life, I'm talking about living in sin that you know you shouldn't be living in, and you just keep living in it, and, 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 and you know you're not living right. Uh, you're, you're, you're not in fellowship with God. And so you need to confess that sin to the Lord and ask Him to help deliver you from it. Repent, turn from it. And so we look within, but we're also looking within in the sense of why am I partaking of the Lord's Supper? Am I partaking of the Lord's Supper because I think it's going to uh, give me forgiveness of my sins? Am I partaking, it, partaking in a ritualistic sense? Is there no emotion involved? No, I need to look within. And then I need to look to others. Look around. Is there someone that I'm in a bad relationship with? It could be a husband, could be a wife, right? You left the house arguing, and by the time you get to church, you act like you're a Christian and everything's okay, right? I've done it before. Hey, me, Beth and I fight. So, you know, we do. I know, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, we do. Uh, she usually wins the arguments. I trained her well. In the beginning of our marriage, I used to win every one of them. And I just trained her, and now she's really good. And I just throw my hands up, and you win. It's many words, Rob, many words. Just wins it every time. So look to others. Is there harmony? Is there fellowship within the body of Christ? And then lastly, look to Christ. Look to Christ. Am I worshiping him? Am I rem remembering what he's done for me? Am I truly proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes? Am I looking forward to him coming? Look to Christ. So look, to, look within, look to others, and look to Christ. And then he ends Ends these words, therefore, my brethren, verse 33, when you come together to eat, wait. Wait for one another. It's one of the reasons why we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we always wait. So everybody wait. We all get that piece of bread, right? And we don't just, thanks. No, we just wait. Everyone receives it. We do it together, right? We wait for one another. Paul says, wait for one another. Don't be exploiting the poor people. Provide a meal for the poor. Love upon them. That's what he's saying there. If anyone is hungry, let them eat at home. Lest you come together for judgment. And he says, the rest I'm going to set in order when I come. These are Paul's words of how we can, God's words, I should say, how we can truly partake of the Lord's Supper, preparing our hearts through self-examination, celebrating what Christ has done for us, Remembering what he's done for us, discerning the Lord's body, looking forward to his return. Amen? Amen. And so with that being said, I want to call uh, the men who are going to be serving the Lord's Supper today uh, to you. Come forward. And I'd like for you also um, to, it's right over here, there should be an insert in your bulletin, our covenant. That uh, I'd like for us to read together, and then I'll have a word of prayer, and we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together. Got it there, brother? Um, anybody need a copy of the covenant? This is uh, the church covenant. So if you are a member of Calvary Baptist Church, this is what you've covenanted together uh, as a family of God. Um, and so th this is really for members of the Calvary, but I, I don't have a problem with every one of us reading it with the hope of someday you will uh, desire to join Calvary Baptist. Uh, this is what we've covenanted together. This is what makes us a church, and it's good to be, be reminded of it. So once a month, we'll read this covenant together, reminding us um, there needs to be a, a cultural change within the body of Christ, that we, we are, are, should be fellowshipping together, as it says here in our covenant, walking together.
And so, why don't we all stand? Sitting there for a while. And I'll read and do the best you can to follow along with me, all right? Since we have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ and have experienced acceptance, forgiveness, and redemption of God our Father, we covenant together as members of this church that with God's help, through the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit, we will walk together in brotherly love, we will show loving care for one another and encourage, counsel, and admonish one another, we will assemble faithfully for worship and fellowship, and will pray earnestly for others as well as for ourselves. We will endeavor to bring up those under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We will seek by Christian example and personal effort to win others to Christ and to encourage their growth toward Christian maturity. We will share one another's joys and endeavor to bear one another's burdens and sorrows. We will oppose all conduct which compromises our Christian faith and will uphold high standards of Christian morality. We will prove the reality of our conversion by living godly and fruitful lives. We will maintain a faithful ministry of worship, witness, education, fellowship, and service. We will be faithful stewards of our resources and abilities in sharing the gospel with people of all nations. As a result of this covenant relationship, we will seek earnestly to live to the glory of God who brought us out of darkness into his everlasting light. We will moreover engage that when we are, we are removed from this place, we will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we will carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the church that you have called out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you for the universal body of Christ, but we also thank you for the local assembly here, Calvary Baptist, and each person that is gathered here under the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that each person here this morning knows for sure that they are part of your body, that they've turned from their sin and they've placed their trust in your son Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And your word promises that they've been placed into the body of Christ, your beloved son. And so we are your body. We are your church. And we are gathered together to partake of the Lord's Supper. May you be honored and glorified as we examine our own hearts and we ask you to search us, to try us, to see if there's anything in our hearts that we need to confess to you. Let's all bow our heads for a moment and just you pray in your own heart to the Lord to search your heart. Dear Lord, thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for Jesus dying for our sins. And thank you for the ongoing forgiveness that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't tell us there's no um, hidden agenda there, Lord. You are a forgiving God. And you know the weakness and the, the uh proneness of our heart to wander. You, you know us. We are weak. But you are strong. Help us to trust you, Lord, not just to confess, but also to trust you. And I pray, God, that you will move in the midst of this congregation. We would all become one. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. And the men will gather the elements and we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together.
time in here to pray, and I'll read the scriptures, and we'll partake together. Our Father, we come together now to remember what Christ did on the cross for us, that he shed his blood so that we could have remission of sin. We remember that he suffered and that he died and that he was buried. But we also remember that he rose again from the dead and that he ascended into heaven. And today he's sitting at your right hand. And Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the compassion. We thank you for the love. We thank you for the mercy. We thank you for the grace that was involved in his death and burial and resurrection. And we thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven, even though we don't deserve it. And we want to give you the honor and the glory forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you for taking a body, coming in human flesh to experience and taste death for everyone and for giving your life so that we can have it. What a selfless act of love. Help us to Hate our sins as you hate them. Help us to truly turn from them and to ask for forgiveness constantly, continually. Thank you for this time that we can remember what you have done for us, forcing us, in a sense, to turn from sin, ask you to purify us. Oh, what child of God does not want to walk with you? Thank you. Thank you so much for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
your blood be shed for us, Lord. This is an impossible thing in our minds. Don't think evil at all things of God. And it's possible because of the love that you have for us, Lord, and loving us, giving your all for us, Lord, to save us. God, please help us remember now that as we go through this week, what you did for us, Lord, and our attitude as we go about our day, <coughs> the compassion we need to have for our, the people that are out there we come in contact with, Lord, because we're the only Christ that people might see. Father, let us let us revel in that, Lord, and, and, and be the Christians that you would have us to be, because we are your workmanship, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for uh, this sacrifice that we are remembering. Thank you for the person of Jesus and what he's done for us on that cross. You are a good, gracious God, and we thank you and praise you. May you guide us as we continue in worship. We thank you for the 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 ability to give to you. And we pray, God, that you'll bless our worship and giving. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why don't we uh, switch now to a time of, of we, we worship the Lord in our giving. So I want the same guys, I guess, we can use. By the way, the men and I have been, uh, the leaders and I have been discussing why don't we let? Why don't ladies help us with get, with collecting the money? They probably do a better job than we would do, right? I don't know why it's always guys doing this. It's some kind of tradition that we're going to break, okay? And so, if there's any lady here that's a member, obviously a member of Calvary Baptist, that would like to serve in this capacity of helping us collect the uh, offering on Sunday morning, or or in that matter, you can feel free to just let me know, and I'll put you on the list, okay? Everyone except Michaela. Just kidding. All right. Brother Joe, will you uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon this? Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning for reminding us of the body that you've given for us, Lord, the blood that you shed for our sins, and the fact that we ought to come revering that, Lord, and in reverence. us to realize how much is given, how much you allow us to have, and how little do we deserve of it, Lord. And help us that we would give back in the sign and the symbol, Lord, that we would care, we are thankful, grateful, and we want your kingdom to go further, Lord. 